Dr. Hussey, welcome to Mind Body Peak Performance. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. All right, let's get started today with the unusuals or non negotiables you've done for your health, performance, and bioharmony. Uh, yeah, I mean, most days, maybe five days a week, I when I wake up, I go and do like this, I don't know, 15, 20 minute little yoga stretching routine. Um, and then I go and sit in infrared sauna, usually for about, you know, anywhere 15 to 20 minutes. In the winter, it's a bit longer because it takes my body a little longer to heat up. Uh, and then I get out of the sauna, do a cold shower uh, right after that. And yeah, and then get my day started. And how did you come to that routine? Like I try and do the sauna as often as possible, especially in the winter. And getting it out of the way in the morning is just uh, the the most effective way. Because if I, I find if I don't do it in the morning, then it's probably not going to get done or things just, you know, the day happens and it doesn't happen there. Um, and same with meditation. So while I'm in the sauna, usually I meditate. Do you find that using the sauna too late at night disturbs your sleep? Uh, no, I haven't. Um, but it's been a while since I used it at night. It's it's usually in the morning or at least midday. Well, today I want to talk more about the new cardiovascular health paradigm that you're uncovering, moving away from the traditional models and at least considering some of the new. So can you give us a, like a brief intro of what we're going to cover in terms of your expertise and theories and knowledge around the cardiovascular system? As most people probably know or assume, uh, most of the talk about cardiovascular disease is, is diet, exercise, and cholesterol, and that kind of thing. Um, that's where the, the, the conversation centers around. I found in, in my research and in my own health journey that it's way bigger than that. Um, there's what, much more to it than that. And so some of the things is, well, one thing is that we don't really understand the true function of the heart, in my opinion, as, as a population, or at least definitely within Western medicine circles. They don't understand the true function of the heart, why it's there, what it does, that kind of thing. The whole cholesterol paradigm of thinking about heart disease and it driving heart disease is, in my opinion, wrong, or at least not the whole story. And we can talk about lots of different things as far as, you know, the three different imbalances that drive heart disease, which... I believe our poor metabolic health, inflammation and oxidative stress, um, which are kind of the same thing, even though they're different, um, and uh, an imbalance in the autonomic nervous system. So that's the stress response of your autonomic, autonomic nervous system. Yeah, I mean, I center around those things uh, and, and kind of give heart disease a much bigger definition um, than, than most. And there's a lot of misconceptions about the heart and heart disease. Well, that's the perfect place to start. So before we get into that and your model, let's get a little information about who you are and how you came to be here interested in cardiovascular health in general. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just like many people in the space who are interested in health. Uh, it was kind of my own personal health journey that, that um, created this uh, passion and eventually this book that I wrote. But uh, yeah, so as a kid, I had a lot of inflammatory uh, conditions, you know, everything from uh, irritable bowel syndrome to allergies to asthma. I used to break out in hives, uh, huge hives all over my body. And the doctors were like, well, we don't know why, you know? And, um, and all this, all these inflammatory conditions eventually led to autoimmune type one diabetes where my body, you know, the theory is my body attacked the cells that make insulin and I no longer make insulin. So I'm, I'm type one where I'm having to, you know, inject insulin for blood sugars. And throughout my life, or I guess my parents and I were kind of thrown into this Western medicine world to help manage those conditions, uh, keyword manage them, not, not cure them. Um, I guess it was in college. I started, you know, figuring out that the way I live my life, uh, and my lifestyle had a direct impact on my ability to manage these conditions. And I've since gotten rid of all of them, uh, except for the type one diabetes is kind of is collateral damage that from that inflammation. Um, but yeah, so I started to figure out that, you know, just through trial and error that, that the way I live my life, uh, impacted my ability to manage my conditions and, and live a healthier life. So I started exploring that and then, you know, got all this education as a chiropractor and nutrition and functional medicine master's degree and all this stuff. And, you know, I thought that all that stuff was going to explain to me why I got sick or, or give me the answers. And, you know, they were good degrees and they were good baseline educations to get. Um, but the real education that I, I have now, I feel like it was just kind of self-driven you know, never stop, always try and learn, uh, no preconceived notions, just keep looking for answers. And, and, uh, eventually I did. And, 
and I, you know, I'm heavily predisposed to heart disease because of being type one diabetic. And so um, that was always a special interest of mine, just find out all the information I could about heart disease, why it happens and everything. And, um, and so the information I found was very contrary to what is taught in Western medicine circles, but even in, you know, as a chiropractor and, and, and that's education, like we totally misunderstood the function of the heart, in my opinion. And so it was just kind of this interest of mine. And eventually I, I put it all together and started sharing things on social media and, and people seemed interested. So I wrote a book and, and here we are. Yeah, I found that very fascinating that for something that's an integral part of every waking moment of our days, we can misunderstand it so drastically. When you were going through your own research and looking outside of palliative care into actually getting to the root cause or root causes and to address it on your own, to actually address it instead of just covering it up, how did you go about finding that information and knowledge? Were you combing through certain resources or did you look back at ancient texts? Like what was your approach there? Um, I mean, a little bit of both of those things. I mean, I guess a lot of the direction that I got was from, I say different podcasts and things, which is why I like coming on podcasts because, um, you know, that, that kind of, uh, didn't teach me everything, but it, it would get me started on new, new resources, you know, um, like people would mention certain books or certain, um, research or whatever on podcasts. Uh, and I would, uh, I would go and I would read all that, you know, sometimes twice, uh, or I would read the books and then look at the resources in the back of the book and read those too, you know, and, and just, uh, continually, continually reading. I mean, I mean, I think the year before I wrote the heart book, I think I read like 70 books that year. Um, so it's just constantly consuming the information. A lot of it I disagreed with, or wasn't what I ended up believing in or, or, um, making part of my wellness routine. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I would, I would just constantly read and listen to podcasts and, you know, watch lectures and different things like that. Uh, that was just, that was who I was. I, I was just constantly wanting to learn. Yeah. You had that fire, that drive to discover more, to understand. And you would take, it sounds like each of these different avenues as a spring point to look into further research and you wouldn't necessarily like believe everything you're hearing or learning or reading, but you would use that to guide your search. Yeah. And there was no like filter through which I used to consume information. It was just like, okay, this, this person, this author, this, what has an opinion. I want to know it. Even if like, there, you know, sometimes, um, especially within Western medicine, you know, there's kind of this like, oh, that person's not peer reviewed, blah, 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 research, whatever. I'm not going to read it. It's worth nothing. It's like, well, maybe it is, you know, let's read it, see um, what it is. And so I guess I came at it from that perspective. Yeah. Well, congratulations on writing your book, Understanding the Heart, Surprising Insights into the Evolutionary Origins of Heart Disease. And given that you've had some surprising insights, I'd love to unpack those today with you and cover some of the things that would be most beneficial to understand from your own research. Yeah, for sure. Um, where where you want to start? Uh, I mean, you made some claims at the beginning that we don't understand the heart in its full capacity. And that would be a, a good one to start with. I mean, most people when they think of the heart, think of a pump. They think of pumping blood and fluids throughout the body and common area for dysfunction and disease. Maybe it seems a bit scary given like the prevalence of problems with it. So let's start right there. Yeah, I mean, the heart, you know, people think of it as this pump uh, or this thing. And it, and it kind of makes sense when you look at it, you know, it's it's contracting uh, and blood is moving out of it. Uh, and then it goes into these pipes that we call arteries and veins and and it keeps moving through those things. So it, it, it when you look at it from a you know thousand foot view, you say, oh, yeah, that's what it does. Um, it's contracting, it's moving the blood. You know, I, I go through in my book, like some of the history behind that. And like the, the person who first described the arterial system or the cardiovascular system, I uh, was named William Harvey. And, uh, he, um, he was even, he even questioned that, you know, he was just like, I don't, I don't know that, that the, he says the heart is the fashioner of the blood, uh, which you can kind of interpret fashioner of what he, what he meant at that time, uh, based on how they use the language. But, um, I, I interpreted it as mover of the blood. I just wasn't sure. So yeah, there's, there was a lot of, you know, history behind heart disease and, and, um, you know, discovery of the cardiovascular system. And they questioned it. There's another guy named Leon, I'll butcher his last name, uh, Monto Sofliu. He's a, he's a Dutch guy. Um, but yeah, he did a lot of research. It was just like, yeah, this is impossible, uh, for the heart 
you know, in the size that it is to forcefully pump the blood around the entire body. Um, it just doesn't make sense based on the physics of it. And there were other scientists that tried to recreate the cardiovascular system as a, as the heart being a pressure propulsion pump, and they just couldn't do it. Uh, no matter how hard they tried, they, they couldn't figure it out how, how it would work that way. And so then the question becomes, does the blood move around the body if, if the heart can't do that? And, and the heart does do some pumping, um, but it's no more than enough to, you know, contract and get the blood moving through the chambers of the heart. Um, there's no way that they could create enough force whether the physics of it makes sense when you're thinking about trying to move the blood throughout the entire body. When we look at, you know, the heart, it, it actually it functions more like what we call a hydraulic ram. And I didn't know what a ram, hydraulic ram was when I first read that. I had to go look it up. And there's some good YouTube videos that kind of explain how it works. But basically, it's it's it operates more on the physics of fluid. Um, and so, like, it, it's flow operated. And so the blood or water in a hydraulic ram situation is flowing on its own uh, already. And it's flowing into the hydraulic ram. And so once fluid is flowing into it, that's how the ram operates. Um, it has to have that flow. And so people will say, well, how does the blood move on its own? And so to talk about that, we have to discuss this thing called fourth phase water, which is structured water or exclusion zone water. It's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different names for it. Uh, but basically, water has the ability to hold energy. And when it does hold sufficient energy, and this is radiant energy from the sun or from the earth or whatever, um, then it actually, when it gets next to a water-loving surface, a hydrophilic surface, it actually structures itself into what's called fourth-phase water. It's kind of between solid and liquid. It's kind of this gel state. It structures itself onto hydrophilic surfaces, which the lining of the artery happens to be, lining of the veins happens to be this hydrophilic surface. And so when it does that, uh, the mechanism by which it does that, which we can go into if you like, but um, it actually creates an energy gradient. The fourth phase water, the structured water is very electronegative. And then because of the way it cleaves off hydrogens uh, from the water, it leaves a very electropositive area in the lumen of the artery or away from the fourth phase water. And that creates an energy gradient, kind of like a battery that starts uh, blood flowing or water flowing. And, you know, the, the blood is about half water, uh, more or less. And so they've done this in the lab of Gerald Pollack at University of Washington um, and Gilbert Ling before him and Albertson Georgie, like all these guys have kind of discovered this, uh, Harold Tillman and, and people like that, um, which kind of gives us this new understanding of biology in general. But when that happens, you know, they put this hydrophilic tube in water, they put energy into the water and the water just starts to flow automatically. No pressure propulsion pump, no other energy besides the radiant energy put into the system. And it will continue to flow. As long as radiant energy is put to the system, it will continue to flow indefinitely in one direction. And so that's kind of what's happening um, in uh, as far as the cardiovascular system is that um, as long as the water in our blood has sufficient energy, it's creating flow. And so then it's flowing into the heart, making it operate like a hydraulic ram, the contracting of the, the heart muscle uh, the, in the ventricles is more like a, well, it, it's for another reason. So if the water's or if the blood's moving on its own, then it's like, well, why is the heart there? Um, and what is its role? And one role, it has two roles. One is that it, it vortexes or spirals the blood because one way that you can energize water is by vortexing it or spiraling it. If everybody's seen like, you know, water in a river and it flows past a rock on the other side, it kind of eddies. Um, that's, that's, uh, you know, spiral or vortexing. So that's what it does. If you look at the muscles of the heart, um, they're oriented in the spiral like nature. Um, so when it contracts, it actually contracts in this spiral like that. And also when it flows through the valves, it gets that eddying that happens. And so this, this heart, the heart is like this vortexing chamber, um, or four different chambers. When you say it energizes, is that creating more ATP? Is that oxygenating the blood or water? No. So it's, it's actually water can hold energy, like in the form of radiant energy. And so when it stores energy like that, uh, it's not ATP, it's not oxygen. Those things are separate. Um, then once it holds that energy, um, then that energy allows it to structure itself. It's the energy that the, the water needs to cleave off a of hydrogen and then combine with other, because, you know, water is H2O. Uh, so it takes one of the hydrogens off and leaves an oxygen and hydrogen combined. And those oxygens and hydrogens combined with other oxygens and hydrogens that have been cleaved off and they form this lattice-like structure. And I describe all this in the book with images and things um, that line up planarly along a hydrophilic surface. 
uh, and that's the structured water. Uh, kind of like, I, I imagine it like fence panels lined up on each other, you know? Yeah, that's, that's just the energy needed to cleave off those hydrogens, which is which can't be from ATP because there's no mitochondria in water uh, unless you're in a cell. And, and, and so, yeah, that's what I mean by energizing. Um, it's just your body or water, I guess, and we're, our bodies are mostly water, absorbing that energy from the environment, um, which takes on the whole biophysics nature of, of our bodies, which we should really pay attention to. Um, it's much more important previously thought, I feel like, in this gaining attention. But yeah, so that's the first reason is that, or the first role of the heart is to be a vortex, you know, and spiral the water uh, in the blood so that it, when it's energized, so it gets energized so that when it gets to the arteries and veins, it has energy in it that it can structure itself. But you can also get that energy from like the outside sources, like infrared light is the most absorbed by water, which is why infrared sauna is so beneficial. And, you know, the sun is the original source of infrared light. It's about 40% infrared light. But the second role of the heart is actually to slow the flow of blood during exertion, um, which people kind of you know, do just what you just did. You know, they were just like, what? And the, so they've done a lot of studies on this on like endurance athletes, especially soccer players, that the reason that the heart gets bigger uh, in endurance athletes, you know, it's not because it's pumping blood more forcefully because they're using their heart more. It's because it's more efficient at slowing the flow of blood. You know, if it, tissue de tissue demand for blood, well, the, the, the speed of blood flow is, is driven by tissue demand. So if tissues are demanding more blood, um, then it's going to flow faster. So when we start working out, we start running or something like that, tissues demand more oxygen, more nutrients, uh, especially the muscles. If we didn't have a heart there, uh, all the blood would go over to the arterial side, trying to forcefully give the tissues um, nutrients and oxygen and things like that. And the venous side would collapse because all the blood would go over to the arterial side. And so the heart is actually there um, as kind of the stock gap to slow the flow of blood during that process so that we can maintain pressure between the two systems, between the artery and veins, because if we didn't, the venous side would collapse and we would die. So, and they've shown this over and over again in, in studies that I talk about in the book that during exertion, that's exactly what happens. The heart uh, slows the flow of blood to allow that to happen. So those are the big two. Is there a third? Not really. No, I mean, those are the two big ones. Those are, those are the main ones that I know of that I, that I interpret from everything that I've looked at. Like that's the why the heart is there. Uh, it is not to forcefully pump blood. Because I, I remember thinking when I was learning about the heart in chiropractic school and just doing all the gross anatomy and everything and just learning like thinking like, man, my heart in my head, I'm thinking how oh, it's responsible for pumping all the blood. I mean, it never stops your whole life. It just keeps going. Like, that's crazy. That's like, that's uh, too much pressure, you know, but in reality, it, that's not, you know, the heart doesn't have that much pressure on it to deliver blood. You know, we have other mechanisms that do that. I think that, you know, understanding the true function of the heart is really, it, it's, it's uh, particularly relevant when it comes to, you know, heart failure um, and understanding heart failure, why it happens, because you're blaming the heart on heart failure and heart failure is basically um, the heart is not pumping the blood anymore, right? Quote unquote. Um, but in reality, the heart was never responsible for doing that or solely responsible. It does a little bit of moving in the blood, but it's not solely responsible. So um, it's really a breakdown of other mechanisms. It could be, you know, there's a component of poor heart metabolism, not efficiently, you know, actually moving the blood through the chambers of the heart, but it's also breakdowns of these mechanisms that I talk about in the arteries with fourth phase water uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, putting your body in the complete wrong environment, whether it's poor lighting, poor electromagnetic fields, you know, not being outside in nature and things like that. Like that is um, a huge driver of heart failure. And the way we're treating it is incredibly lacking in the information I just, you know, talked about. Like they don't understand the true function of the heart. And the thing that drives all this home for me, when you look at the research on infrared sauna use in heart failure patients, it is absolutely phenomenal. They get they get amazing results. Their their hearts decrease in size because you know in heart failure this heart gets bigger because it's being forced to do more pumping than it's designed to do. Um, and so there, there are injection fractions increase, the, the swelling goes down, the size of the heart goes down, like infrared sauna, putting infrared light, energizing the structured water, uh, getting it moving again without having to put so much pressure on the heart heals the heart. It's just, it's phenomenal. I don't understand why they don't use infrared saunas, every cardiac rehab lab everywhere, but, uh, but they just don't understand this research, I guess. Yeah. I talk a lot about a concept I call bioharmony or working with the body to accomplish greater health, performance, and quality of life. And one thing that I keep thinking about as you're speaking is, are there different ways that we can go about increasing our ability to vortex that 
structured water? Like, can we clearly use infrared saunas, like natural light exposure? What are some of the other practices we can do to make our body a more efficient, our whole body a more efficient pump and maybe alleviate some of the stress that may be building on the cardiovascular like heart? Yeah, so it's it's getting the fluid moving without having to rely on a pumping heart, uh, or I could say I should say contracting heart because it's not really pumping. But yeah, so it's it's other things that get the fluid moving, and so that is yes, infrared sauna, especially in the winter. I mean, just exposure to infrared light, and so you know the original way to do that was the sun. Um, so spending time outside, but in the winter, infrared sauna is a great way to offset less time outside. And you know, I, I try and sit in there as many times as I can, but even just three, four times a week for like twenty minutes. Um, it's incredibly useful. And you have to think about it too, because there's other fluid in your body besides blood. There's cerebrospinal fluid, uh, there's lymphatic fluid, and those things don't have this contracting organ that's moving them throughout the body. So how do they move? And it's the same with, you know, with being sick and like the lymph nodes, they swell up and things like that because they're trying to detox the debris and, um, and, and detox the body. I mean, that's what being sick is, is, is detoxification. That's the symptoms we know as being sick. And so infrared sauna, helps with that as well. That's why there's studies that show the infrared sauna use decreases the amount of time people are sick or the amount or how often people are sick. So that type of stuff. But then also it's not just things you can add to your routine. Like grounding is another one um, that you can add to your routine uh, and things like that. But it's also putting your body in the right environment, the things that the things that break down or, or I guess you could say de-energize the body, you know? And so that's the wrong electromagnetic fields. The reason that grounding is so effective is because the earth gives off the right electromagnetic field compatible with our bodies. And so if we're bathing ourselves in the wrong electromagnetic fields, um, all the time, at least, um, that's going to interfere with the body's ability to energize the water and, and, and move fluid and things like that, but also the wrong types of light. People think about pro processed food, but there's processed light as well. Uh, you want light that's the full spectrum uh, of light and not just a processed one like like fluorescent lights, it's just the blue light, or it's you know, like, um, TV screens and computer screens and phone screens are all pretty much the blue light version, uh, processed light, and so and that's that's the case for anything. When you think about something, you know, you're exposing your body to whether it's food or electromagnetic field or light or whatever, you want as unprocessed as possible, as un as un um, altered by humans possible, because that's what your body's used to. Um, so it's not just but also like even the right noises, the right sounds are very important um, as far as structuring the water in your body. So like uh, the sounds of nature are harmonizing, you know, with our physiology and they create more structured water, or more energized water, I should say, um, allowing it to structure itself. There's research that shows that the right sounds harmonize the crystals in water. Water crystallizes itself into the into correct things, whereas whereas uh, even even the wrong emotions. Um, like if you express anger at water, it will destructure itself and become fractionated and whatever. Um, whereas if you express love and gratitude and, and things like that, um, water becomes, uh, more harmonized and, and, and so it's just pretty fascinating. Like, and when you think about the modern world today and all the toxins we're exposed to the wrong EMFs, the wrong light, um, they're, they're removing ourselves from nature, being indoors all the time that kind of stuff, we're, we're doing the exact opposite thing, giving our physiology the wrong signals. Um, we should be giving it much different signals. Come on, Dr. Hussey, you're mentioning all the typical health and wellness practices that we should all be doing anyway. Yeah, that's right. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of common sense, right? When you think about it. What about the quality of the water? I'd imagine that has a large impact on the water vortexing throughout your body. Especially with, so one actual research study I do have that shows uh, an effect on structured water or the ability of water to structure itself um, is with glyphosate. Glyphosate actually decreases the ability of water to structure itself, I think, by like 15%. And that's, I don't, I don't know if that's, oh, that has been published yet. Yeah. I mean, I originally got the information from just talking to Dr. Pollock through email, but, um, but it's been published now. Yeah. Toxins like that in water interfere with its ability to hold energy and structure itself. And so there's lots of toxins in our water, uh, so it's tap water um, specifically, but even like, you know, plastic bottled waters and things like that, they're all pretty toxic. Um, so you want to, you know, filter your water, but also you want to mineralize the water. That's really, really important because water is supposed to have minerals in it because it's really hard to hydrate a cell and then also structure the water in that cell because the water in our cells is also structured. It's really hard to do that without minerals. Um, 
probably be impossible. So because minerals are actually what allow hydrated minerals are actually what allow water to get into cells. Um, so very, very important. And once it's in the cells, then it can structure itself on the proteins, the cytoskeleton of the cell, but uh, that kind of stuff, super important. Um, you want to, you want to get toxins out of water, but you don't want to drink like uh, RO water or, or distilled water because that will actually dehydrate you uh, if you do too much of it because there's no minerals and you've got to re-add the minerals back. Yes, that's a very important note. And whenever I talk to people about water quality and reverse osmosis comes up or even distilled water, I always make sure that we discuss the importance of remineralization, even if it's something as simple as a high quality pinch of sea salt, ideally some of the more trace minerals included or quinton or something along those lines to get a broader spectrum. But it's vital for anyone using reverse osmosis water or any like highly stripped and purified forms of water like that to make sure to add something back or it will leach from your body and from your bones and dehydrate you and dehydrate you yeah which is the opposite of what people think they're doing yeah okay and the other thing you mentioned in the intro is a alternate paradigm to the whole idea behind cholesterol and lipoproteins being these bad molecules thing, things that we should completely avoid and i know when i've looked into some of the research i've seen correlations between higher cholesterol and longevity people living longer and if you think about it, there's an absolute necessity for cholesterol in the body to build steroid horm hormones, which are vital for everything from our health, performance, our longevity, our quality of life, and then also for uh, neurons in the brain. You can't have myelin sheath without cholesterol. And what's your view there? Why are you not scared of lipoproteins and cholesterol? First off, just to step back and give you kind of a, a philosophical answer, I feel is incredibly short-sighted and maybe naive to, to think that we can, we can test for one molecule or one substance, one whatever in the body and say, okay, this one thing is the driver of a chronic disease of any, of any sort. Um, that's really short-sighted. It's really, you know, we're this very complex biological ecosystem and we're probably never going to fully understand it. Uh, and so to assume that we can, especially by, you know, taking blood work, which is, you know, this one instance in time of one tissue in the body and thinking that we can fully understand the entire complexity of it is, is naive and it's, it's not serving us. Right. Uh, so that's kind of the philosophical answer, but the more I guess, technical answer is things like you were mentioning, you know, well, first of all, the history of this theory is not uh, not a great one, um, you know, because in the 1950s, heart disease rates were rising, and people didn't know why. They were freaking out about it. Eisenhower famously had a heart attack while he was in the in the White House, and uh, so people were scared of this new disease. But that's the point right there that it was a new disease. Humans have been eating cholesterol and saturated fat for. Uh, many, many years, yet heart disease is a relatively newer disease, only about 100 years old or so, probably less than that, as far as the epidemic we know of it. There was definitely cases of heart disease before then, but as, as far as the epidemic we know it um, and the rising rates, it's only about 100 years old or so. We were looking for an answer, um, and this guy named Ansel Keys gave everybody an answer. It was that cholesterol or more saturated fat and cholesterol in the diet uh, were correlated with higher rates of heart disease, which there are some studies that show that. But that's a very low form of research. It's called epidemiology. All it can do is show that two things are happening at the same time, a correlation. It cannot show that one something is causing the other thing. That's what clinical trials are designed to test. Like you do epidemiology, see what see if what the relationship is between something. If there's a relationship, which now we have to test and see if it's causative. Unfortunately, most of the time in nutrition science, that's rarely done because it's very expensive and very time consuming to do those clinical trials. So they do epidemiology and most of our recommendations from academic institutions or government agencies are based on these very low forms of nutrition research. So yeah, when we look at the idea that cholesterol is very vital for the body, um, I mean, it's everything from cellular communication to delivery of energy, uh, transport of fat soluble vitamins, incredible for um, nerve and brain health. It insulates the nerves, um, makes all our hormones. I mean, and then not just cholesterol itself, but if your liver makes cholesterol, it takes fatty acids and it makes cholesterol. And there's this big, you know, long process to do that. But some of the intermediate steps along that process are also used for other very important things like making antioxidants 
and health of insulin receptors and things like that. Um, which is why when we take statin drugs, people get insulin resistant or, or they get uh, inflammation and things like that. So, so there's, there's that whole aspect of cholesterol is essential for the body. Now the question is, is people say, yeah, well, it's essential. That's why we have some, but what if it gets too high? Right. Um, it's that a problem. And when you look at studies where they, there's a, there's a condition called familial hypercholesterolemia, where it's genetically high cholesterol. And we're talking about, you know, total cholesterol is in like the 500s for these people, which supposedly is supposed to be below 200, but I don't think that's necessary. But, um, but yeah. Um, and then these people, when they studied them, you know, they went back like 200 years over different generations and traced these genetics of these people who had this. Um, and they found that people who had this genetic or high cholesterol were at no more risk than people with quote unquote normal levels of cholesterol. Um, and that the people who had this familial hypercholesterolemia who did die early, it was usually because they did something else too. Like it was, it was directly correlated to the amount of smoking they did or um, processed foods they ate or stress they had or whatever. So, you know, damaged cholesterol can definitely contribute to heart disease or, or damage to the lining of the artery. Um, but it's what's causing the damage to the cholesterol that's the issue. It's not the cholesterol itself. Uh, that's why oxidized LDL or damaged LDL is is correlated with higher rates of heart disease because there's something in there damaging the LDL that's also damaging other things like the lining of the artery. Or to short-sightedly say, okay, cholesterol is causing this disease. We're going to aggressively treat it with statin drugs or now these PCSK9 inhibitors, which is a newer um, drug that um, uh, affects cholesterol levels in a different way. Um, by doing that, um, very irresponsible, I think. Um, but also it's not working because if we look at the studies um, on if statins uh, and cholesterol-lowering medications work, they're not working. Cholesterol or um, heart disease rates are continue to rise um, despite you know all these cholesterol-lowering medications, despite bypass surgeries and, and elective stent placements and all these different procedures, um, heart disease rates continue to rise. So the main paradigm of why Western medicine thinks heart disease happens is the treatment, their treatment of that is, is not working. And so that's just more evidence that we've, we've missed the boat, right? I mean, if we want people to say, well, what does cause damage to the lining of the artery, then it's not that. And that's a logical question. And it's anything that causes uh, inflammation and oxidative stress. Anything that free radicals are things that occur in the body, the body makes them themselves, and they're supposed to act as signaling molecules, but they get out of hand, then they can cause damage to tissue. Um, one of those tissues is the lining of the artery and these free radicals. I, I compare them to like the Looney Tunes to the Indian devil where he's going around like crazy. And he's these, these free radicals are, they have unpaired electrons and they want to be paired really badly. And they'll do anything to get that other, that other electron, including steal it from a tissue and create damage to that tissue. When they steal it, they'll do that to the lining of the artery and that causes damage. And the body says, okay, we should be able to repair that damage because there's normal wear and tear that happens to the lining of the artery. Um, and, and the body's ability to repair it is very key, but if it can't repair it, um, uh, because we're insulin resistant or it's just too much to handle, then the body has to do something. Cause if it doesn't repair it, your the artery is going to rupture and you're going to bleed out. Um, so it has to do something to repair it. And so in that case, it, it, uh, it clots. That's what it does. Um, it creates clotting. And so there's some LDL, there's some cholesterol in those clots, but most of the time it's just clotting material. And that's what atherosclerosis is. Uh, just like if you cut your hand, your body's got to stop that bleeding. So it clots and forms a scab, right? It's the same kind of thing that's happening, uh, more or less, on the lining of the artery. Um, and so we have to ask ourselves, well, what damages the lining of the artery and makes it clot? Well, there's lots of things. Um, there could be all the stuff we just talked about, the wrong light environment, the wrong and toxins in our water or toxins, just generally exposure to, to synthetic toxins that we most of human life on earth, um, but also psychological stress, um, poor diet, all these different things. Um, and then the list goes on and on. Plastics uh, can all cause uh, inflammation in the lining of the artery. And that just starts the process of, of build up of the lining of the artery, uh, of atherosclerosis and lining of the artery. Mm -hmm. Well, before we go on to some of those foods and parts of the diet that you would have your eye on, I was just thinking as you were speaking about like, the way that our medical system works, it's like, okay, there's this condition, we identified this little thing, and it's probably the enemy. So we're going to attack it. And I remember back in my undergrad, in some basic neuroscience courses, we were talking about 
beta amyloid and Alzheimer's and tau proteins and all this. And I'm like thinking to myself, even back then, is that really the underlying cause? If it is, we should be able to decrease those levels and see a noticeable improvement in outcome. It's people actually living longer with better memory. And instead that didn't take place. And same with cholesterol. We should see that across the board, if we lower cholesterol, people have better health outcomes. And if people don't fit into that and you increase their cholesterol and they feel better and they don't die, they don't have any complications over the long term, perhaps that hypothesis is not worth testing and there's something else below that level that we should actually be investigating. Yeah, and and it's a good point and, and people need to understand that the vast majority of medical research is very reductionist. It's It's trying to analyze one biochemical pathway in the body and change it so that they can make a drug that alters that biochemical pathway because all their funding is usually from pharmaceuticals. So the vast majority of it is from pharmaceutical companies and they're not going to fund research that's not going to help them develop some new product they can make money on. And so that's just the influence of industry on research. Um, and so I used to, I used to work at this, uh, my clinic used to be um, more or less across the street from Virginia Tech uh, medical school and uh, research institute. And I would treat a lot of these uh, scientists or students over there and ask them what they're working on. And every time they'd be like, oh, I'm working on this very specific, and they'd tell me this, that, uh, the specifics of this very specific biochemical pathway. And, I was, and they were like, yeah, I'm going to see if I can alter this, alter that, and then to kind of develop a, a drug for that. And I was just like, oh, okay. You know, and it was just that over and over again. And, you know, that type of research has, has led to a lot of our understanding of, you know, biochemistry in general, which is useful. However, it's being applied in a way that's not helping us at all, you know. Yeah, that can actually even be dangerous. And I think you'd find, you get a kick out of one of my recent articles I wrote on the principles of bioharmony. And one of them is to take the opposite of approach of reductionalism. And although it's a little more complicated, it's not as sexy, clean, one pathway, one outcome type of uh, scenario, it leads to better, longer lasting improvements to overall well-being. Yeah, well, it's about, I think, being humble before nature, whatever you want to call it. People, you know, if you're religious, you want to call it a certain type of God, whatever. If you want to, I talk about, you know, love between humans or, or nature or whatever, like it's being humble before that and realizing that we're never going to understand it fully. And we're definitely not going to understand it by trying to understand certain pathways of it rather than looking at it as this big whole complex biological ecosystem that we're never going to fully understand. And we see this in nature all the time. You can't take, you know, the deer population away, you know, and without starving the wolves and, and then you get this and then without the wolves there, then something else goes bad or, or, uh, or without the deer or something that the lichen overgrows the trees and kills the trees. It's just like, you can't alter it like that. Changing or changing one specific thing because the ecosystem works uh, for like that for a reason, you know? And so we have to kind of be a little bit more humble and probably understand that we're never going to fully understand it. And our best bet is to look at the natural environment of whatever it is we're looking at and, and try and recreate that within the modern world if we can. Yep. Biomimicry. So you mentioned the first like underlying cause or part of cardiovascular disease, and that was oxidative stress. And then what are the other two? first one is um, poor metabolic health. So basically, is your body taking the foods you eat and metabolizing it in a way that is not harmful to you? Um, and so what that means is, are you taking the, the energy stored from the chemical bonds in your food and turning it into energy in an efficient way, um, in a way that's not going to create more oxidative stress, it's not going to create more oxidized molecules and things like that. This boils down to diet, pretty much. Um, I mean, there, there are other things that can lead to poor um, metabolic health, like stress and things like that. It can push your body in a state where it's not focused on metabolism. But it basically boils down to diet. And, you know, there's all these different diet dogmas out there, I feel like, whether it's vegan or carnivore or paleo or whatever, you know, all can be diets that can work for people for specific things. And I just think it's important to recognize that the diet that heals you may not be the diet that's best for you the rest of your life. Um, as you change and uh, your health changes, you're, you may need a different diet or a different lifestyle or whatever. 
Um, but the main point for metabolic health is eat a whole foods diet. Uh, that's, that's the man. Cause you can achieve metabolic health on a, on a vegan diet. I don't think a vegan diet is, is the best diet for humans. And I don't think most people are going to do well on that. Um, but if you switch from a standard American diet to a whole food diet, even if it's vegan, you're going to achieve metabolic health, at least in the short term, long term, you're going to be deficient in minerals and maybe not have metabolic health. Um, so any diet that creates that. And so what I tell people is the main things I would stay away from are processed sugars, vegetable oils, grains, and then I add legumes to it too, because I don't think legumes are very good food source because of their anti-nutrients. Um, but yeah, if we stay away from those things. That's probably 70% of the, the issue with diet, at least in, in the United States. Um, so stay away from the sugars, the grains, the vegetable oils, and legumes. And you're going to do yourself a lot of favors and you're going to achieve metabolic health. You know, faster ways to achieve metabolic health, I think, are maybe a, um, a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet may achieve that quicker. But it may not. It may cause issues for you as you adapt too fast. But there's lots of different things. There's no, there's no need to be dogmatic about diet. Um, we just want to eat a whole foods diet. Uh, know where your food comes from. Get it as fresh as possible. Uh, organic is very important. Even though it's not free of toxins, it's way less. Uh, and it votes for no GMO. So I think that is important. Um, but yeah, that's that's metabolic health. It's it's mainly diet and it's mainly whole foods. Mm -hmm. And if you go organic, you're also going to be getting less glyphosate, which, as you mentioned earlier, reduces the energetic capacity, the vortexing capacity of the water in your body by 15%. So that alone is a big savings. And for the grains and legumes and all that stuff, I think there's ways of doing it properly. But unless you're going to soak, sprout, ferment and do these ancestral techniques to break down some of the anti-nutrients, which virtually no one does because it's so time consuming and such a hassle, then I try and avoid it, avoid all those as much as possible. Even if you like, you know, do like a long fermented sourdough bread, which is probably the only bread I would ever eat. It's still got gluten in it. Research shows that gluten is inflammatory for everyone, even if it's just a little bit and you don't really react to it. Like any of the legumes, like you soak them and you get rid of a lot of the anti-nutrients. That's great but it's still not a great food as far as like nutrient gaining nutrients from like bioavailability of nutrients. doesn't mean that you can't do it in a better way. Like you said, uh, there's definitely better ways to do it. Um, but I will, when I look at food, I want it to be the most nutrient dense bioavailable thing I can get. Um, uh, and that's largely animal foods for humans. Um, you know, when we look at our ability to, uh, to absorb, uh, nutrients, um, doesn't mean we can't supplement our diets, create variety with, with different plants and, you know, know the more toxic ones and reduce the toxins that, uh, we can. Um, but, but yeah, I, I center my diet around animal foods, do some organ meats a few times a week, things like that. And then, and just to kind of do the plants on the side. Mm -hmm. What about your take on saturated fat and cholesterol rich foods? Yeah. I mean, best foods for humans. Uh, if you, if you look at, uh, uh, so people talk about saturated versus unsaturated fats. They talk about cholesterol and, and non-cholesterol um, foods and things like that. And But another way to classify fats, I mean, people talk about omega-3 versus omega-6 and different things, but another way to classify fats is plant fats versus animal fats. Um, so cholesterol versus phytosterol. We are animals. Uh, cholesterol is what the fat that we use. Phytosterol is the fat that plants use. Uh, so plant fats, they have more phytosterol, obviously, so... We're talking about avocados and nuts and things like that, you know, but the main source these days is the, is the vegetable oils. We're eating way too many of those. Uh, that's the main source of the phytosterols, but our body can use phytosterols in, in a pinch, you know, if it needs to, if we don't have enough, uh, cholesterol, but it really needs cholesterol. It really needs animal fat because we are animals. And if you look at studies, too much phytosterol can create rigidity of red blood cells, which is not something that we want because we want our red blood cells to be flexible. So when they get down to capillaries, they can bend and move and get through them because if they're rigid, they can damage arteries. It can cause stroke, things like that. And there's actually studies that show a higher correlation of more vegetable oils eaten and more strokes happening uh, or more phytosterols, say, not just specifically vegetable oils, but phytosterol in general. The vast majority of our fats should be saturated fats from animal sources. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, cholesterol, like we mentioned is used for many different things and we need to definitely now dietary cholesterol doesn't necessarily change your cholesterol levels in your blood. Um, that's mainly driven from your body taking fatty acids and 
and making cholesterol from them, but it does absorb cholesterol and use it for things in some capacity. So um, that's the type of fat we want to be giving our body. Mm -hmm. So that's number two. And is there a third? Yeah. So the third is a little known or not little known, but little talked about, I should say, aspect of physiology and heart health. And that is balance in the autonomic nervous system. So our autonomic nervous system is a system in our body that's perceiving our environment uh, through our senses and interpreting, are we in a safe or threatening environment? Um, and if it's safe, then our body focuses on things like digestion and procreating and detoxification and, and things like that, uh, sleeping. But if it's, if it interprets we're in a stressful environment, it says, okay, we got to get away from that. And it shuts down all those things you would do in a non-stress um, situation. And, you know, it, you know, pumps the blood or, or moves the blood to your, to your muscles and dilates your eyes and it, it gets you ready for a stress. You gotta, you gotta fight it off or flee the stress or whatever. And so parasympathetic is the non-stress state and sympathetic is the stress state. In, I, I kind of define health as the ability to adapt to different situations. Um, so are we metabolically flexible? Can we adapt to different fuel sources? And unfortunately today, people are so trained at burning carbohydrates, they forget how to burn fat. And that's this inflexibility. But it's the same with the nervous system. Are we flexible enough to deal with the stress, have a stress response, handle the stress, and then go back to normal, right? And that's that's health to me. Um, people are so obsessed with blood sugar being flatlined, and I, and they they eat some, they get their CGM and they eat some carbohydrate, and it skyrockets to one thirty or something. They're like, oh my god, I'm like, well, that's exactly what it's supposed to do, as long as it goes back down within two hours, right? That's that's adapting to something. Um, and it's the same with the autonomic nervous system. Can we have a stress response happen to us, adapt to that stress and then go back to normal? Or do we have that stress response? And then we stay stressed, you know, low, low grade chronic stress the rest of the day. Can we, um, you know, can we get cut off in traffic and, and, you know, be pissed about it and then let it go kind of thing. Right. And so the best measure of balance in our autonomic nervous system, because it's not about, being in sympathetic or being in parasympathetic, because that never happens. We're always getting signals from both. Um, and they're always keeping each other in balance. And the best measure of balance in our autonomic nervous system is heart rate variability. There's, I don't think there's any coincidence that, you know, the, the organ that we measure balance in our stress response um, through is the heart, because the heart is the most connected to our emotional state. It's why we say things like, I love you with all my heart, or I gave it all my heart when we're, you know, you know, something uh trying for something hard or whatever like that like we're we're putting our heart into it right because it's 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 like i think it's like our sixth sense it's like our emotional sense and our heart actually has more nerves that come from it to the brain telling your brain what our emotional state is and there's actually nerves that connect our heart directly to the muscles of facial expression because how we're feeling through our heart is expressed through our face um that's how we see how other people are feeling how their heart's actually feeling you know and so the heart is intricately connected to balance in the autonomic nervous system. Um, and, um, and so it's incredibly important to, to maintain this balance. And unfortunately, you know, humans have this big brain and that's great. It's gotten us, you know, really far uh, as far as a species. Um, but it also leaves us as the only species that can think their way into a stress response. Cause that, you know, a stress response is supposed to be something that's life threatening and your body responds to that life threatening thing and and then gets away from it or you know whatever and then it uh it goes back to normal and so if uh if we have problems doing that uh that can create a lot of issues we get stuck in this this um having life-threatening responses to non-life-threatening things and those non-life-threatening things could be am i going to pass this test this person cut me off in traffic like we live in this modern world that's incompatible with this stress response that we have because we can think too much you know we could see something stressful happening to somebody else and fear that it's going to happen to us, right? Whereas animals don't necessarily do that. I mean, they learn from that, but unless the stress is directly happening to them, they really don't have the reaction. It's it's really interesting that uh, that we are that way, and it's it's like I said, served us in many capacities. However, in our modern world, with all these unnatural stressors and the constant unnatural stressors, it leaves most of us out of balance and leaving us with low heart rate variability, which means an inability to healthfully adapt to a stress and return to normal. Yes. And we interviewed Dr. Jay Wiles of Hanu Health back in episode 72. And they created 
a new generation of real time heart rate variability biofeedback system. And it has like a resonant frequency breath rate and all kinds of these things. So you can help understand when you're dipping into a sympathetic dominant state. So you can help realize that you're holding your breath while you're emailing just now and hopefully fix that pattern and get back to your life and quell the sympathetic response, go back into parasympathetic and really save those big bursts of stress for real life or death situations. Yeah. So tell me more. You already mentioned that you don't like some of the traditional cardiovascular diagnostics and screenings and things that people do because it's too simplistic. It's only looking at one metric or a couple in the case of a more advanced panel. So what do you like to see if you are going to investigate this to make sure that to give yourself peace of mind that you're on a healthy right track? Yeah. And I mean, all testing I take with a grain of salt because it's one biomarker and we can't, I never allow testing to tell me or any of my clients or patients that if they're healthy or not, you know, like some of this testing can tell us if things are really wrong and we should intervene pretty quick. And that's kind of like, it's like, it's like the emergency room for Western medicine, like very necessary. You know, we have situations where things are really wrong. You need emergency care right away. Um, but after the fact, Western medicine is kind of like, well, we don't know what to do. It's the same with blood work. If there's something really wrong on it, great. Uh, we can intervene. We know what to do. Other than that, we shouldn't use it as a uh, too much as a markers if we're healthy, right? So, but that being said, there are some things you want to test for insulin resistance because that's the best indicator of if we're metabolically healthy or not. Um, and that's key as far as atherosclerosis goes because if we're insulin resistant, the arteries can't heal, them, heal themselves, making them more likely to develop clots and, and form atherosclerosis. So um, insulin resistance is best measured through the trig to HDL ratio. Um, so when you're looking at a lipid panel or a cholesterol panel, don't worry about cholesterol. Look at the trig to HDL ratio. Trig being triglycerides? Triglyceride, yeah. Um, and so that should be 1.5 or lower of that ratio. And then also a fasting insulin level uh, is really important because you could have normal blood sugars but have a really high insulin level, which means your body's having to make more insulin to keep that blood sugar normal, which suggests insulin resistance. And so um, you want that number to be less than 10, but ideally, like optimally, less than 5, um, that fasting insulin. And so there's that. And then... For inflammation and oxidative stress, I mean, you could really get into the weeds testing for this, and there's lots of different things you could look at. But, I mean, generally, just take HSCRP, see if there's some systemic inflammation going on. You know, trying to you know go deeper than that may just be more costly um, for you. And in reality, changing the things that, like if there's, if there's no inflammation, uh, doing the things the things that you would do to maintain no inflammation or the things you would do to treat inflammation are the same thing. So just do those things. Uh, you don't need any tests to confirm that unless you're kind of a visual person, you want to see changes or something like that. Then you don't need to go into the weeds testing for inflammation, oxidative stress, but there's lots of different things you could test for. Um, and then heart rate variability uh, is, is the other uh, for, for the third imbalance, which is the autonomic nervous system imbalance. That's the best thing to be tracking there. And, you know, it's, it's said that normal is anywhere from 20 to hundred. Um, so it's important not to compare your heart rate variability to someone else's, uh, but to get your baseline, which may take a while, you know, a week or two weeks to kind of see where you're at and what's normal for you. And then you can use that baseline to, you know, uh, to see, you know, what stresses you out? Like something, you're going through something stressful. How's the heart rate variability looking? You did something great and it looks better. What'd you do the day before? You know, like what is it? You can kind of get that baseline, but that's kind of the, the best thing to, to track um, and just work to improve it from where your baseline is. I love to use HRV to determine my training load for the day, how much I'm going to train, what kind of volume, what styles of training, because if I'm very stressed out, Sometimes adding a nice heaping, long, soul-crushing workout on top of that can only take me further down and like get my system stuck into sympathetic overdrive and parasympathetic to try and recover, which is not necessarily a healthy thing. And one thing I know from, I can imagine from your work, is that there's certain types of exercise that you are a fan of and are not a fan of. And I think that might be surprising. Yeah. Uh, very important point you just made. Yes, that is very. So I used to have a strength coach in college who would say, you know, because we all had like these plans of what we were going to lift, you know, these kind of weeks of plans that to get us to, you know, peak performance during the season or whatever. And so he would always say, 
lift what you like. Here's what you're supposed to lift today. Assess yourself. How are you feeling? Whatever. Lift what you think you should be able to lift because you're going to get more out of that workout doing that than trying to go to what you should be lifting. And, and now in retrospect, looking back at that and using heart rate variability would be the ultimate number to look at that. It's like it's, it's, it's low for some reason today. I shouldn't do this hard workout. I should tone it back or do something different. You know, I'm going to get more out of that. Um, so very important point that you made. Um, yeah. And as far as exercise, you know, it's thought that this cardio type of exercise, endure endurance exercise, um, aerobic exercise, whatever you want to call it, is best for heart health. And I think it's beneficial to it in small amounts. But this endurance exercise, like marathons and things like that, I don't think are very good for us. Um, I'm not going to say that people shouldn't do marathons. If you get something out of it, uh, maybe some social aspect or some life goals, or maybe it's your profession even, um, then by all means, like go for it. But I don't think that anybody should feel like they have to be able to run miles and miles and miles or bike miles and miles and miles in order to achieve health. And in some cases, I actually think that it's damaging for heart health specifically. I mean, it's, it creates a lot of oxidative stress and inflammation, um, which is kind of a good hormetic stress in small amounts. But if you overdo it, it could create an issue. And there are, there are cases and there's not like tremendously huge amount of them, but there are cases where people drop dead of heart attacks during marathons, you know, people who are untrained and, and try and go like that couch to 5k couch to marathon type thing. You know, I don't think that's healthy. And I just want to put out there that we just, we don't need that level of exercise uh, to achieve health. And I think that, you know, weightlifting and maintaining muscle mass is, is much more beneficial, uh, than long endurance exercise. Uh, you really don't need more than two, three miles, I think of aerobic type exercise to, to maintain health. So yeah, it's kind of surprising for people, uh, to hear that because it's tired, touted as cardio. Oh, you, Oh, that's best for your heart. We got to work a hard a little bit. Um, I remember when I was in chiropractic school, I, I came out of the weight room and I was breathing a little heavy because I just finished a set of something. And one of my friends, one of my classmates, she was on the treadmill and she was like, why are you breathing hard lifting weights? And I was like, well, it's the same exact thing. It's just that I'm doing fewer reps with a higher intensity of muscle. And you're just doing the same, you know, you're just doing a ton of reps on your treadmill there, you know, but very low resistance, just a lot of it, you know? And so over time you're going to start breathing heavy, but people just interpret cardio as this thing that makes you breathe heavy and your heart work harder. And it's just like, well, resistance exercise does the same thing just in a shorter time frame, and, you know, more, more resistance and things like this, but it's the same mechanism. Of course, I'm going to breathe hard, but just did 15 reps of something. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I've noticed my wearing my own heart rate monitor while lifting specifically that I can get my heart rate up past 150, 160 beats per minute. If I'm really pushing myself hard and I will absolutely be breathing heavy after a set. So I think it's a false dichotomy that you can only get strength benefits from strength and no cardiovascular conditioning from that as well. For sure. And remember, it's not that the heart is pumping faster or contracting faster uh, to deliver blood is that the blood is going to the tissue faster and the heart has to increase its speed of contraction just to keep up. That's what's going on. That's a good reminder. Let's go on to the things that you can take, the peptides, the small molecules, the cardio supportive nutrients, all these types of things you can do that I'm sure people are wondering about and they may have heard about to improve the health of their heart and overall body. Well, some of my favorite ones to point out are that things like creatine and carnitine and carnosine and taurine are all nutrients that are largely found in animal foods that are incredibly beneficial to the heart. Like taurine is especially beneficial to the lining of the artery, and that's found in the highest amounts in pork. And there's some small amounts in, in plant foods, but um, it's in mainly animal foods. And uh, carnitine um, is one thing that uh, allows your body to use fatty acids, like allows your cells to actually take them and get them into the mitochondria so they can be used, So, which is incredibly efficient compared to burning glucose. So carnitine, I mean, the word itself, like carnivore, carnitine, it's found in animal foods uh, in, in the highest amounts. And again, there's some in plant foods, but no, nowhere near the amounts in, that we find in animal foods. So um, how could a food like animal foods uh, be so bad for us when it contains these nutrients that are so beneficial to heart health? Um, carnitine specifically has been shown to help heal 
um, the heart tissue after like a heart attack or something, you know, when the tissue dies, it, it helps heal the tissue more than any other nutrient. Um, and so, uh, pretty, pretty amazing. And so I like to point that out. And so there are different supplements that, that if you needed to boost your amounts of those, you could take, um, but I'd always rather get it from food, uh, first and foremost. Um, so, so yeah, but then magnesium is incredibly important for heart health. Um, so is, uh, something called CoQ10, um, which again, we get, uh, from animal foods, especially organ meats, um, like, like liver and heart, um, are really high in CoQ10. Uh, that's really important for the metabolism, making, making sure the metabolism heart tissue is, is, um, on par. Um, I'm trying to think, uh, I mean, just fatty acids in general. Um, those are the preferred fuel source for the heart fatty acids and ketones, uh, and, and most organs, but specifically the heart that prefers fatty acids and ketones. Um, yeah, to be more efficient. There's actually studies that show that, um, even in the presence of glucose, if you put ketones in there, the heart will choose to burn the ketones first, which is unlike other tissues where it'll burn the glucose first, because there's this oxidative priority where it's, but it's different for the heart. Um, and I think there are reasons for that. And I, I talk about that in um, in relation to heart attacks and things. So would ketones be a good choice for someone that just had a like heart complication of some sort? Potentially. Yeah. But I mean, so the failing heart, like heart failure, also the heart prefers ketones. Um, the only time I've seen that the heart prefers glucose for fuel is on reperfusion, which is when, you know, the heart is damaged because it lost blood flow, uh, which means it can't get energy um, or oxygen or nutrients or whatever. And when blood finally does get restored, it comes back into that tissue, that reperfusion, the heart seems to prefer glucose in that situation. And to me, that's because it's just a faster energy source. Um, and during that time, you want to be able to recuperate um, and use those nutrients as fast as possible. Um, but other than that, your heart prefers fatty acids and ketones. And so like long-term healing, especially heart failure, yeah, ketones may be something you could supplement with. I'd always rather you encourage your body to make its own ketones rather than take some exogenously. Um, but it could be something that helps boost recovery and, and some people to use that way. What about omega fatty acids like omega-3s, say krill oil or fish oil or the microalgae like spirulina and chlorella? I'm not a huge fan of fish oils um, because lots of times, most of the time, in my opinion, they are heavily oxidized. Once you take them out of the animal, they're going to start to oxidize um, and, and really the issue is not, is, is not that there's not enough omega threes is that there's too many omega sixes. It's about the ratio, right? You want the right ratio, which is one to one ideally, um, or one to 1 1.5, or, you know, people argue about that. Really what we should do is decrease the amount of omega sixes and, you know, the omega threes, it will, the ratio will even itself out. The omega sixes come from the vegetable oils and, uh, and the seed oil, things like that. So we want to decrease the amount of those. We can get plenty of omega threes from eating, you know, fatty animal foods and things like that, and butter and egg yolks and things like that. Um, that's where we should get uh, those, like in a whole food, um, where the fat is is more or less preserved um, that way. Especially the grass fed, grass finished meats and animal products. You know, because if you look at if you look at grass fed versus, um, you know, grain finished because most cows are fed grass their whole life, but then the ones in the, in the industry are, are force fed grains at the last three months of their life or whatever. Um, if you look at that, the nutrient content is about the same, but the main difference is the omega three ratio is, is a little different, uh, from what I've seen. And there's some people that say that's not true, but, um, but yeah, that seems to be like the, they're higher. The omega threes are higher in the, in the, um, the grass fed. Um, but there's also many other reasons to uh, eat grass fed, like less toxins and better for the environment. That kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Well, Dr. Hussey, I have barely scratched the surface of what I want to cover with you today, but I want to be respectful of your time at the same time. So we will slowly begin to wind this one down. And I have a couple more questions for you and then a rapid fire round. Before we go on to that, how can people get a hold of you or pick up your new book? Um, my website is resourceyourhealth.com, uh, and my books are on there. Um, my blog is on there, um, and I do online health consulting, and uh, that people can find that there as well. I'm also on social media on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter, uh, just dr. Stephen Hussey, 
Stephen with a PH. Um, people can reach out to me there. Uh, my book's on Amazon, or if people don't want to use Amazon, they can use, um, they can go to Barnes & Noble or Books a Million or go directly to the publisher's website, which is Chelsea Green. Um, they can do that. And uh, and yeah, that's how people can find Awesome. And the links to all this will be in the show notes. And Stephen, now, if there was a worldwide burning of the books and all knowledge is lost, but you get to save the works of three teachers, who would you choose and why? I think the first one is a guy named Rene Dubo, uh, who is a microbiologist. Uh, but he, he just, his study of microbiology gave him a very unique uh, perspective on life and humans and how we interact with the world. Um, I loved his book, Mirage of Health. So uh, that'd be one. Um, and then I'd say uh, a guy named Victor Schauerberger, uh, which uh, his his work on water and water and nature and its importance is, I think, vital to our understanding of, of life. Um, and then let's see, for the third one, um, probably... Well, they kind of they kind of talked about the same thing. A guy named Harold Hillman and Gilbert Lane. They talked about the same thing as far as water and uh, specifically into like cells and, and human biology and that kind of thing. So um, probably Hillman. I would I would want his work preserved um, because I just think that understanding that is how we're going to figure out how humans should live, you know, or or how we should be or 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 not be. Uh, like that work is incredibly important. Yeah, I've read Schauberger's work and I was blown away when I realized just his book, The Water Wizard Alone, was like 300 pages just on water. And he has a bunch of other books too. And it opened my eyes. But I love being able to ask this question because now I get to go out, go back and explore some of the different influences you've had on your life and work and go down that all those different rabbit holes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah. Okay, we'll go into a quick rapid fire round and then we'll call it a day. Okay. What are your thoughts on the NMR lipid panels? Interesting, but not necessary. Um, just because it, when you look at the way fourth phase water forms in the lining of the artery, it's called exclusion zone for a reason. Uh, it actually excludes anything that's not it, aside from some very small hydrated ions that can get through. And so if we have a healthy intact fourth phase water lining on the artery, it doesn't matter how big or small your particle size is, how many particles are there or anything like that. Um, they're not going to get through. So it's really about doing that rather than figuring out all that stuff that the MR pro NMR profile shows you. Mm. Are you a fan of any specific mitochondrial or metabolic peptides? Um, it may be in the short term if someone's healing. Um, but long-term I'd, I'd want you to be not dependent on those things. They're taking any type of supplement, really. Um, I'd want you to be able to sustain metabolic or mitochondrial health without it. Um, but yeah, maybe in the short term, um, to help someone heal and get more energy to continue healing that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hussey, are there any big myths that we forgot to cover in this episode that you think deserve a couple seconds of time? Um, well, a few other interesting things I talk about in my book are, are, you know, the whole idea that a, a blockage is the only way that a heart attack can happen, which it, it does happen, but it's not the only way. And, um, and, uh, there's, there's what I call metabolic heart attacks. Um, so that's kind of a myth that, that blockages cause heart attacks all the time. And that elective stent placements are useful because studies show that they're not, they don't prevent heart attacks. Uh, so those are big myths. This other one, another topic I talk about in my book is not really a myth, but it's interesting. I discuss why cancer of the heart is so rare because it is one of the rarest forms of all cancer. Despite continually increasing rates of cancer, heart cancer continues to be very rare. And so I think there are reasons why that is and have to do with metabolism. They have to do with structure of heart cells and things like that. Okay. What are you most interested in and in researching these days? Hmm. Well, always cardiovascular disease. Um, I, that'll probably be something that I always look into, but really when I'm looking at cardiovascular disease, I'm looking at health in general. I mean, you know, it's, it's not just specific to one disease process. Um, so, so yeah, but, um, um, I guess I, I, I've started looking more, I mean, as a chiropractor, you'd think I'd, 
I would always look into this, but I've started looking more recently into like pain and chronic pain. Um, and I have, you know, a lot of different theories about that. So maybe that'll be the next book, but I'm, I'm starting to explore that a bit more, um, than I, than I have in the past. Well, certainly let me know if you decide to explore that avenue further. I'd be <laughs> very curious to read your thoughts, knowing that they're going to be controversial in some way. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. What's one thing that your tribe does not know about you? I don't know. Probably that, uh, maybe my heritage, like I'm Irish, um, descended from Irish and French, you know, but, but mainly Irish. I mean, if they, people met me, they'd probably see the fair skin and my beard turns red if I grew it out. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe that, my heritage. Okay. Well, Dr. Hussey, how would you like to leave listeners today? Are there any particular words of wisdom you'd like to end with? Keep an open mind. Um, like, you know, like, like, I guess don't be dogmatic about things. Don't, don't stick to an idea just because it gave you some benefit in your life. Like always be open to change because um, the world is changing you're changing as you grow and learn. And the only way we can get progress going forward as an individual or as a society is if we, if we explore new ideas and entertain everything. Amen. Well, I thought there was only like maybe a half an hour worth of material we could cover on cardiovascular health and some of these new paradigms. But I now see that there are hours we could talk about. Thank <laughs> you for coming on today for sharing some of your time. It's been such a blast chatting with you and getting to explore some of your work. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Happy to come. All right. Take care. Until next time. I'm Nick Urban here with Dr. Stephen Hussey signing out from mindbodypeak.com. Have a great week and be an outlier. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, the information in this video is for information purposes only. Please consult your primary healthcare professional before making any lifestyle changes.